pray together. Father, we thank you that we can lift our voices in praise and song to you. And now, Father, as we turn our attention to your written word, may it come alive in our hearts and our minds as your living word. And may we experience you this morning together as we continue to worship in the word. In Jesus' name, amen. We have been going through quite a bit of hard times the last year and a half, and we feel it, uh, we experience it, uh, the churches do, businesses do, everybody does, and we all have our stories, we all have our, our uh, sorrows about it and our difficulties with it, our struggles with it all. And beginning next week, I want to do a series uh, called Three Important Habits for Hard Times. And I want to talk about this. It's actually four parts because we want to look first next week at how Jesus practiced these three habits in his own life and how they helped him because he did not live in an easy time, in an easy life in his ministry. And then we're going to break them down and look at each one of them and how we can do them in a very practical way in our lives and develop those good habits in our lives. And after that series over, I'm going to do another one uh, just really geared to our times and I want to do uh, how to get a grip on, on our lives in these times. And I'm going to talk about how to handle anxiety, how to handle a nagging fear the next week. And then we're going to talk about how to handle an uncertain future uh, when we don't know what's next. So that's kind of coming up for several weeks. But today we're finishing the Gospel of John. And if you have your Bible with you, you might open to chapter 21 and have it ready uh, for today. We... Uh, Chapter 21 begins with seven of the disciples of Jesus going down to the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias and to do some fishing. That's kind of going back to their roots. Uh, and there's a 40-day period where Jesus appears at different times with them to instruct them before he completely ascends uh, to the Father. And then the day of Pentecost comes when, of course, he comes with the power in the church. But here we are in this in-between time, and they're kind of lost for what to do, so they go fishing. And when they're coming back from the night of fishing and the early morning light, you know, that gray light just before the sun comes up, they can see somebody on the beach at a fire cooking fish, and it's Jesus. And he invites them to have breakfast with him. Pretty cool, because here is the resurrected body of Jesus, and and Paul explains to us in 1 Corinthians 15 how different the spiritual body will be from our, our natural physical body. But we get the wrong impression sometimes because we always think of spiritual as ephemeral and, you know, and can disappear and, and kind of like a ghost kind of thing. And when, you, when you see Jesus in his resurrected body, they don't immediately recognize him, but it's still Jesus, but he's more. He's Jesus raised. And this new spiritual body, Jesus says, he eats, he has bones, he has muscles, he has tissue. It's, it's, a, it's a real body. He's not a ghost, he says. But it's Jesus more. And it's really kind of exciting. So when we meet them, we, I want to kind of focus or, on John chapter 21, verses 15 through uh, 19. So if you have your Bible, John chapter 21, verse 15. It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. I want you to pick up each time Jesus uses his full given birth name, Simon Barjona, Simon, son of John. Do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. 
Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. After saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now I want to focus on these verses today. And I want you to kind of think of our whole series of John and go back in time to chapter 8. And you remember the story that John tells in chapter 8 because he tells this dramatic story of a woman who was actually caught in adultery. And how these judgmental, fanatical religious guys brought her in front of Jesus, plops her down, and says, the law of Moses says she should be stoned. What do you say? You remember what Jesus did? Great story. Because he got down on the ground and he started to write something on the ground. We don't know what, but he began to write, maybe in the dust on the stones. And they kept kind of nagging him. What do you say? Should she be stoned according to the law of Moses? When he stood up, he said, whoever here is without sin, you go ahead. You cast the first rock. And one by one, John says, they started walking away. And then he says this interesting phrase, beginning with the older ones first. You, when you first look at that story, you remember it. There's only this guilty woman surrounded by a bunch of judgmental men. And when the story ends, there's only the guilty. Just the guilty. And it's the older ones who are first to admit it. Why? My guess is the older we get, the more stuff we've done and we're willing to admit it the older we get, that we're not perfect. Now, it's quite possible that I'm the only person in the room that has ever failed my Lord. But my guess is some of you have done that too and have a lot of failings and fallings along the way. And in this last message from John, I want to show you and I want to talk to you about how God restores Peter to usefulness And how he does that in our lives too. Because what Jesus does for Peter is what I believe equipping the saints for the work of ministry is all about. Because I think when we read that passage in Ephesians 4, equipping the saints for ministry, that's what leadership does. I think we get the impression that we ought to have a seminar and teach people how to do things, like how to read the Bible and how how to evangelize or whatever. I don't think that's what it's about at all. I think it's about how we help God work in someone's life to restore them to usefulness when they feel like dirt and they feel like they can't anymore. And what Jesus does with Peter here, he did with Paul, restored him to usefulness. And he does the same thing with us regardless of what happens in our lives. He takes our failures And he creates something good out of our messed up lives. So let's look at Peter. Peter's a kind of a fun guy to get to know. He's an independent businessman. He's a fisherman. He owns a boat. That's what he does. He's an independent businessman. And he works hard. He works hard all the time to feed his family. It's almost a day-to-day existence. If I don't catch fish, we don't have anything to sell. If we don't have anything to sell, we don't pay the rent. But he's a competitive kind of guy. You can always kind of feel that with Peter. He's ready to go into action all the time. He's a very direct guy. He doesn't beat around the bush. He's inquisitive, always asking questions. He's a little outspoken, maybe a lot outspoken, He's a real gutsy guy. He's ready to stand up and fight if necessary. But he's also a rather impulsive guy. Uh, Yet, 
Peter always comes across as this down-to-earth, honest guy that you like to hang out with. He's the kind of guy you'd like to have for a friend. You'd like to know him. Back in the Gospels, when Jesus takes the 12 on vacation up into a resort area in the mountains of Lebanon, he gathers them together, and he kind of wants to know, are they getting it? Do they understand who he is? So he begins by asking them, what are people saying on the street? What's the word on the street about me? And they tell him what people think. And then he says to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, bless his heart, is the first to pipe up. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. How would you like to go down in history as the very first man ever to confess Jesus as the son of God and the Messiah? Peter gets that. Peter gets to be that man, that guy. Pretty cool. Except that almost immediately, immediately, Jesus sees this as the, the hinge of his ministry. This is the big shift. Now he goes from these big healing crowd ministries, and he's going to focus on Jerusalem. He's going to focus on the cross now. And so he says to Peter and the disciples, he says, now, now it's necessary for me to go up to Jerusalem and suffer and be killed and on the third day rise from the dead. Right after Peter's confession of faith comes Peter's first great failure. Because he takes Jesus aside. I love the way sometimes the Bible writes things and it just leaves you to your imagination. There's these guys gathered around and they're talking and they're saying these things and Jesus just says this and Peter goes, whoa. And he just sort of pulls on Jesus' robe or puts his arm around him or, you know, over here. You need to come over to where I am. Come, I've got something I need to say to you. I need to say it privately. I need to whisper something to you. There's a, there's a feeling about saying to somebody, you need to come over here where I am because I've got something you need to hear. And that's what Peter's doing. And he, what does he say? You know what you just said, Jesus, about suffering and dying? God forbid that this would ever happen to you, not my Messiah. No. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Not calling Peter the devil, not a capital S on the Satan, it's a small s. He's using the word Satan as, what, as it means, a word. It's adversary, opponent, my opposer. You are an obstacle to God's plan for my life. Don't do that to me. And then Jesus actually lays out the source of his failure. He says, Peter, here's your problem. You're more focused on man's thinking and not God's thinking. You're more focused on the things of this world and the way things are working in this world, and you're not focused on God things. We're going to want to pay attention to that. Because God is a God who loves you so much, he wants to be first in your life, in my life. And we have this nasty, nasty little tendency to replace him. To put something else on the throne, on the chair, in our heart. To say that something else is so important, I've got to have it, I've got to experience it, I've got to know it. Matthew 19, Jesus has an interaction with this young, rich guy. And the rich guy comes to Jesus and says, I need to know, I want to know, what do I need to do? And he's talking personally, what me? What do I need to, know, to do in order to inherit eternal life? The amazing thing is that Jesus actually says to this guy, you only lack one thing. Now, I think if I went to Jesus with a question like that, he'd say, sit down, Gary, and he'd pull out this list, you know, of, of things that Gary has to work on. But with this guy, you only lack one thing. That's amazing. 
He says, your wealth is standing between you and God. You need to give up your wealth and follow me, put God first. He's not saying wealth is wrong. Not saying it's a bad thing to be wealthy. He's just saying in this man's case, the wealth was between him and God. And he says, you need to let that go and follow me. And the man couldn't let it go. And he walks away sad. And he really feels it. He's sad. And Mark says, and Jesus loved him. Loved him. And whether Jesus said this to his disciples or maybe he was mumbling under his voice or, you know, mumbling under his breath, he just says something, but he says, ah, oh, so hard for the rich to be, good, to be saved. And the disciples hear that and go, what? They're shocked. Riches are a sign of being blessed by God, aren't they? That was their thinking, man's thinking in their time. If you're rich, you've been richly blessed by God. And if it's hard for a rich man to be saved, what chance do they have? And Peter speaks up, Jesus, we've left everything. We've left everything and followed you. What's in it for us? A bit of his question is still in that man thinking category, isn't it? Why is Peter following Jesus? Why is he following Jesus? Why does anyone follow Jesus? I've met people who quite honestly have told me the reason that I am going to church, the reason I'm a Christian, the reason I follow Jesus is simple. I don't want to burn in hell. That's it. I go, it's like you've got the best fire insurance in the world. You know, where's the relationship in that? And I've had people seriously tell me, I follow Jesus because I get a free ticket to heaven. Once I'm saved, I can go do whatever I want. They just say, grace abounds. And I've had people seriously say that. It's a free ticket to heaven. I can do whatever I want now because I'm saved. I'm in. Why do some people follow Jesus? Every time, and now, now get this, if you look through the Gospels, you see this. Every time, every instance that Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to suffer and die, and I'm going to be raised on the third day. Every situation where that happens, the disciples are always arguing about who's the greatest among them. Who's going to be first? Who's going to sit on the throne with Jesus? At his right and his left. They're always arguing. What an insight. Jesus can look at their faults. They can, he can look at their misunderstandings. He can look at how they're focused on the wrong things. He can look at all of these things that are just aren't quite there. You know, they're just not quite finished. And he never says to his disciples, I'm fed up with you guys. He comes pretty close. <laughs> but he never says that. He never says, I'm done with you guys. I'm going to get a different 12. I, I can do better than this. He never casts them aside. Folks, there's really good news in that. Really good news. But no matter what you've gone through and what you're doing and what you're thinking and how you're struggling and how it's a battle in your life, Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to throw you aside and get somebody else. Doesn't do it. What we see is a whole bunch of imperfect men being transformed by a perfect God. And it takes time. And we are allowed to see the disciples with all of their faults and all of their failings all mixed together with their faith. That's one of the exciting things about the Bible. It's so real. There's no, no gimmicky stuff that slicks things over and paints a picture that's not real. Now, these are real guys who have real struggles and real doubts. And they're scared at times. And they really foul up once in a while. 
But we can see how Jesus is using all of the painful experiences they're going through and all of their biblical misunderstandings and all of their personal relationship conflict that they have and how he's working through all of that to make something good. He's using all their little bits of failure, like gritty sandpaper, to rub off all of the spots, uh, you know, imperfections in them, and polish them up. Now, of course, as we kind of track along with Peter, we come to his great failure of denial. And I want you to know as we look at this, that as far as I can tell, it, it doesn't say he ever denied his faith in Jesus, okay? It says he denied that he knew him. Now, you may think I'm splitting hairs on that, but I think there's a difference in, in the scriptures and what they're saying. He never denied his faith. He denied that he knew him. I don't know that guy. I don't know that guy. Now, if you have your Bible, go back to the left, one book, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Luke 22. And verse 31. Just a, a few little verses here. 22, 31 of Luke. Notice again the names, how he's using them. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, notice that, and when you have turned again, when you've come back, strengthen your brothers. Now, how does Peter respond? Peter says to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, oh, I tell you, Peter, the rooster's going to crow this day, and you will have denied me three times. Again, he begins with Simon, his given name, his birth name. And I think he wants to emphasize that he's talking to the man who, as he is, not the man he is becoming. Jesus is the one who gives him the name Rock, Rocky, Peter. And Jesus sees this is what you are going to become, a rock. He's not there yet. He's still Simon. And he says, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. And there's something there that we can't see in English. A couple of things. That to sift you like wheat is an idiom in their language, in their time, that meant to just tear you to pieces. It wants to tear you apart. It wants to destroy you. And the other thing we can't see in English is the, that the first pronouns you Satan has demanded you, he wants to sift you like wheat. Those are plural. So imagine the 12 guys are standing there. Jesus is speaking to them. Peter's right here. And the rest of the 12 are right there. And he's saying to the 12, Satan has demanded you to sift you like wheat. But then he turns to Peter and looks him right in the eye. And he says in singular, not plural, singular. But I have prayed for you, and that you is singular. I have prayed for you. There must have been an unmistakable silence and pause. As Jesus says, Satan has demanded you, and then looks at Peter in the eye, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned, when you have turned, when you have recovered, when you've repented, strengthen your brothers. Did you notice that Jesus did not pray that Peter would not fail, but that he would not deny him? He simply prayed that his faith would not fail. He never said, I'm going to pray that you won't deny me. Never did that. 
just that your faith will not fail. And he gave him some assurance. When you have turned again, when you've repented, when you've come back, strengthen your brothers. Use this experience to help these other guys. That's what we're supposed to do with our failures. Use our experience to help others. Back when Jesus said he must suffer and die and be raised, Peter heard it all except the raised part, right? Because he was so focused on man's things, he wasn't thinking anything about God's way of doing things like raising the dead. And he's so focused on his plan for the disciples, his idea of what God should be like, he wasn't getting what God is really like. Now Jesus is telling him, now when you repent, when you turn, when you come back, does Peter hear that part? Does he really hear it? Do we hear it sometimes? When something really awful is happening in our life, do we even think that how, how I... I should respond to this? See, Jesus said, all of them, the devil wants to tear apart. But Peter's going to need some extra prayer. And I'm praying for you, Peter. And Peter's response? He screws up his commitment to full strength. And he says, I'm ready to go to jail with you. I'm ready to go to prison. I'm ready to die with you. I've got a sword right here. Let's go. That is such a human response. Uh, when I was going through my divorce, it was the darkest time of my life. And I was doing everything I could to save that marriage. Let's go to counseling. I'll do whatever. I was screwing up all my courage. I was going to make something good out of this mess. I'm a Christian man, and I'm going to make something good out of this mess. And I had my sword, and I had my shield, and I was ready to go to battle. What I wasn't doing was saying, oh, God, help. Oh, I was, I was praying a lot but I wasn't really listening. And I think that's what Peter was doing. That when the pressure really comes, there's just this tendency to just fight for what we think is right, what we think is the best thing, what we think is going to work. And I'm focused on man's things. I don't see the whole picture. Go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Go to the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's going to be time for prayer. Jesus says, before he's arrested. And Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his special three guys. He says, I want you to pray with me. And pray that you not enter into temptation. The weird thing about that event is that they were successful. But they did their success in a really weird way. They fell asleep. And when you're asleep, you're not being tempted. But they weren't being supportive of Jesus either, were they? He said, pray, and they went to sleep. I need you to pray for me. They went to sleep. Now, here in John 21, after Peter denies him, the disciples are having breakfast. Jesus has made the breakfast. I don't know what fish cooked by Jesus tastes like, but I got a feeling it might be pretty good. And Jesus says to Peter, let's take a walk and talk. So they go down the beach. And Jesus asks Peter a question. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? These are the guys. And he uses his birth name again. He goes back and he starts again with Simon. Not the man he is becoming, but the man that he is. The man that he is today. But it's like he's saying, Simon, let's go back to your beginning, Simon, son of John, and let's get your life started all over again. Let's just get a big restart. So he asked the question, do you love me more than these? 
And that question for Peter has a sting like medicine in an open wound. Do you love me more than these? I mean, these guys, they all fled in fear. But I, I denied you. I denied that I even knew you. And I think Peter must be thinking, you singled me out from all of these others as the one who would fail you the most. And I did. They didn't. I did. Isn't my sin greater than theirs? Isn't my failure greater than theirs? And now you want to know if I love you more than these? My failures. My failures greater than theirs. How could I ever say that I love you more than these? That hurts. And when Jesus asked him the question, do you love me? He uses the word agape, which is the highest form of love. Greek philosophers had the word and they talked about it, but they didn't think anybody ever reached that high. It wasn't until Jesus came and used the word agape and lived it out that anybody ever saw it in action because agape is sacrificial love. It's, it's a love that is totally focused on the other person. It's for the best of the other, not for self. It's way up there. It's the bar. It's the top. How does Peter respond? Yes, Lord, I love you. But he uses the word love that is phileo. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Phileo is brotherly love. It's that affection between friends. It's camaraderie. It's being in agreement and seeing things alike and kind of getting excited about, hey, we're twins. You know, it's that kind of love. And he doesn't even try to respond to that other part about more than these. Peter doesn't respond. He just doesn't touch it. So Jesus asks him the second time, and Peter responds the same. Jesus says, do you agape me? And Peter says, I, I, I fillet on you. Best he can do. And we don't, again, we don't see this in English. But the third time Jesus asks the question, he makes this all-important change. Because Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo oh me? And that just crushes Peter. That gets him. Breaks his spirit. And he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I phileo oh you. You know that I love you. What did Jesus just do? Jesus didn't deny that the bar up here is agape, sacrificial, other person-centered love, not thinking of self. He didn't move the bar. But he started down here where Peter's at, a broken man who's confused and who is just feeling all kinds of guilt and shame and he comes down and says, do you phileo me? And that's what God does with us. He doesn't say, to get your act together, you're going to have to get a lot of strength and a lot of courage, and you're going to have to change your life and get way up here. Nah. He comes down to where we're at. He says, let me walk with you. Let me start where you're at. Let's begin where you are, and then we'll both go together up there but you can't get there without me. And I'll start where you're at. You see, even in the moment of denial for Peter, he was there. He was afraid. He got so scared he denied him. But he was there. And that's what he was forgetting. The other disciples fled in fear. He was afraid, but he was there. Why? Because he loved Jesus so much. Maybe his love wasn't perfect. Maybe he had a lot of misconceptions, don't we all? But he loved him. And each of the three times that Jesus said, do you love me? He always finished with feed my lambs, tend my sheep, take care of my flock. 
do your ministry. God put you here for a purpose. Don't stop doing it because you failed. What Jesus did with Peter, he does with all of us. That's what equipping the saints means. Restoring us to usefulness, restoring us to ministry. Not easy, and it takes time. There's one more failure I want to talk about with Peter. It's in Galatians chapter 2, so if you start going to the right, you go through the book of Acts, and you go through the book of Romans, and you come to 1 and 2 Corinthians, you just go past those, and you'll come to Galatians. And if you just give me a moment, I'll get there too. Galatians chapter 2. Just kind of hang on to that for a second. This is all taking place, what we're going to look at, in a church uh, in Syria, in the city of Antioch, ancient city of Antioch, beautiful cosmopolitan city. People from all over the ancient world were there. Uh, the main street of Antioch was paved with white marble by one of the Caesars. He paid for it personally. They said if it was still there, it was so bright and shiny and wide and miles long that from the space shuttle or from the space station, you'd be able to see it with your naked eye. It would gleam that much. Uh, it was just a beautiful city with theaters and casinos and, and just all kinds of action and business, kind of a business financial center of the ancient world. This is the place where in the church at Antioch, Gentiles, without knowing anything about the Old Testament, without being like Cornelius or anything like that, became Christians. And they were first called Christians in Antioch, which is, means little Christ. Uh, they, reckon, they, they reckon, I guess I can say that. I reckon. They reckon that uh, the city was about 500,000 people, and then in a very short time, 10% became uh, Christians. So this church is 50,000 people. There are five leaders, and Paul and Barnabas are two of the key leaders in the church. Barnabas came first, and then he went and found Saul, Paul, in Tarsus, and brought him down to that ministry. It's Paul's very first full ministry. And he's kind of the associate pastor uh, with these other guys. Large church, mostly Gentile believers. Now, this church is healthy. There, there is no first Antioch and second Antioch in the New Testament's letters. Why? Apparently they were so healthy for so long, they never had any big problems that Paul had to correct. And they never had any big questions that Paul had to answer. Because if you got a letter from Paul, it's like, uh oh, we got a letter from Paul. You know, we got big problems. We got to solve them. You didn't get any. There's no first Antioch or second Antioch in the, in the New Testament. Let's look at chapter two, though, of what happened. This is probably an agape feast. This is like a huge potluck, and there must be lots and lots and lots of people at this meal. And the Jews are sitting on one side, come from Jerusalem, and they've sat down, and they, from Jerusalem, are very legalistic, and they're not gonna eat with these Gentiles. So they sit over there. Now look what happens. Verse 11, chapter two. But when Cephas, Cephas is Peter, it's his Hebrew name, like Saul is his Hebrew name and Paul is his Greek name, Roman name. Peter's the Roman name, Cephas is his Hebrew name. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. That's, that's huge. That's an apostle saying another apostle is condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing, see how he battles fear in his life? Fearing the circumcision party. And when the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before everybody, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like the Jews? And he goes on, and I think this is important. This is, he's saying this to Peter. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. You know that, Peter. 
So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Peter, for though the, through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. And then this, this is Paul saying this to the apostle Peter. Peter, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Now the word condemn is not the same word condemn as in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now in Christ Jesus no condemnation, Romans 8.1, not the same word. That condemnation is a condemnation that comes as punishment or just consequences for the sin that we do. And Jesus saves us from that. The condemnation here in Galatians means to fail miserably. That's exactly what Paul is saying to Peter publicly. Now some people think that Peter's greatest failure was his denial of Jesus uh, at the arrest. I don't think that's his biggest one. I think this is Peter's biggest failure. Because this comes after his restoration to ministry. This comes after being anointed as tongues of fire with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. This comes after performing miracles. This comes after uh, his going to Cornelius when, the, when he's had the vision from God and the sheet come down from heaven full of all these different kinds of food and animals. And God says, anything that I've created is good. It's safe. Huge change of mind. He can go to Cornelius, a Gentile, and he can preach the gospel, and Cornelius is saved. After all of that, he comes to a church, and he does something that he absolutely knows is wrong. And that's the greatest failure. And that's what Peter is, or Paul is saying to Peter. Peter, you know better. You know better. Because your actions are denial of the essence of the good news and grace. And look what you're leading astray, even Barnabas. I can only try to imagine how shattered Peter must have been when Paul chastised him publicly. If you've ever been through anything where you feel like I have just utterly failed, I knew better and I did it and I shouldn't. If you've ever been through that, you know what Peter felt. And I want to, with all my heart, I want to get across, how does God deal with that? He doesn't throw us aside. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to find another 12. He starts where we're at. And he's fully aware of how we're going to try to fix it ourselves. But he is patient. And I want to give you about five things that we can do. Five things that we can learn from all of this. And five things that are really important for us to remember. Number one, love Jesus no matter what. Keep on loving him no matter what. Peter at times had a different understanding of scripture than Jesus. He didn't interpret the Old Testament the same way Jesus did. And he got caught up from time to time in all the political mess going on in their society at the time. And his idea of the Messiah was a bit off. But Jesus, he followed him, he stayed with him. Jesus he trusted, didn't always understand it, didn't always get it right. But he trusted what Jesus said. And Jesus he loved. Jesus' words meant everything to him. Why? Because Jesus loved him 
like nobody else ever loved him. And Jesus could see something in Peter that not even Peter himself could see in himself, and nobody else saw it. Rocky. And there's something about Jesus that's irresistible, and we just keep coming back. He loved Jesus because Jesus loved him so much. And he could not imagine his life without Jesus, no matter how bad it got. So even in times of great failure, he knew at least he could go back to Jesus and Jesus would be strong enough to help him. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says we should pray that we are not led into temptation. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he says to the disciples that they should pray that they not enter into temptation. Why not pray that when we are tempted, we will completely resist? Why didn't he put that in the prayer? Why doesn't he teach us to pray that when we are tempted, we will not fail? It doesn't. It doesn't say that. Why is it that Jesus is only concerned that we not enter into it at all? Because the place of our temptation is the place of our destruction. The place of our temptation is the place of our utter destruction. You can be strong in so many ways. You can be faithful in so many parts of your life. But in some part of your life, there's a weakness. There's an opening. There's a gap. There's a brokenness. And maybe it's, it's a hunger to be known and to be popular. Maybe it's, it's a desire for wealth and prosperity. And, and maybe it's this drive to have power, to oversee, overlord somebody or something. Maybe it's just a, a drive or a hunger for pleasure, a fix. But there's some part of you and of me that is the part of us where if we're tempted, we're destroyed. And that temptation can come like a beasting so fast, but it will fill you with joy juice, you think, until the destruction comes and you're done. And Jesus wants us to know that if that ever happens to you, or if it has happened to you, he still loves you. And he doesn't want you to face these temptations alone. And he will provide a way out. He will provide a way through. He doesn't say, you won't fail. He says, he will provide the way out. He will provide the way through. And he is the only one who has faced it all and never sinned. And the devil wants you to think you're, you're the only one who has sinned like you sinned and you're worthless. Don't think that way. Realize that Jesus is the only one of all human beings ever who has faced it all and never sinned. He's strong enough. He's strong enough. In 2 Peter 2.9, Peter writes, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. Peter didn't get that from some biblical book of good quotes. He got that from his own life, didn't he? That's what Peter learned. Never stop loving. Number two, never let failure define your life. 
Never let failure define your life. If we let our failures define our life, we just start to shut down. If we let our failures define who we are, then we start comparing ourselves with other people and we think, oh, they're so much better than I am. They're so much more accomplished. They're so much more holy than I am. I'm worthless. That comparing will kill you. And then we start listening to our own self-talk. Oh, you've done it again. You've returned to it again. You're like a dog back to the vomit. And we condemn ourselves. And then we start listening to the talk of other people who put people like us down, who judge mentally, come to conclusions, and they just wipe you out. Or they say personal things to you that actually hurt you. Don't listen. Don't let your failures define who you are. Abraham had failures, but that's not how we remember Abraham. Noah had failures, but that's not how we remember him. Moses even failed, but we don't remember that. Not that's the first thing in our list. Jacob failed a lot. The list is endless. The Bible is so honest. Failure is all around us. And we just must not let it define our lives. Your purpose in life is a God-given purpose. And he knit you together in your mother's womb. So when he says, Simon, son of John, he's going back to that little baby that was born, that was knit together by God, and he's seeing in him, you have a reason for being in this world. Now, maybe a lot of stuff has happened to you that's made it all cloudy and confusing. But you have a purpose, and God's purpose is bigger than all this other stuff that's happened to you. We just have a hard time accepting love and grace because we think everything comes with a string attached to it. And we feel like a yo-yo when people start jerking our strings. Third thing I think we can get from this, just don't ever give up. Just don't ever give up. Don't quit. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is talking to his disciples towards the end of the ministry time. And he says, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. By your endurance, you're not giving up. You will gain your lives. And the word gain means to win mastery over. Kind of neat. See, when you, when you endure the hardships and the failures, and you endure the hatred, and you endure what other people say, and you endure a time maybe of betrayal of trust, a friend just betrays you. When you endure the lies, when you endure all the sorrows and you endure all the losses and you don't give up, but you keep on going and you keep on hoping, you will win mastery over your soul. You just don't find Peter dwelling on his failures. And he's got a pretty long list, doesn't he? And if we really look at them and draw them out, Peter, you've got some pretty big stuff going on in your life. And fear always seems to be at the root of it. Have you really dealt with that fear, Peter? But you don't find Peter dwelling on it. What you find is Peter deeply in love with Jesus. Read the first chapter of 1 Peter sometime and just see how he talks about the inexpressible joy and love of Jesus. Number four, don't ever let a hurt be wasted. Don't ever let a hurt be wasted. I don't know exactly how long of a time elapsed between Peter's denial in the garden or at the house and, and, and this beach experience in John chapter 21. I don't know if that was a week or two weeks or 
you know, those 40 day period, I don't know how long that was. But it was some time, wasn't there? And Jesus didn't come right to Peter right after the resurrection and say, Peter, we need to talk. We need to get this resolved in your life. We gotta get this all fixed up. We gotta get you healed. We gotta get you restored. For whatever reason, and I don't know the reasons, he lets us go through time. He lets us think, he lets us experiment, he lets us wonder, he lets us pray. And then when the right time comes, let's take a walk and let's talk. And Jesus will never let a hurt go to waste. Jesus knew that this failure of Peter and these ways that he fails would really put his character to the test and reveal even more clearly his faith. I can't imagine how badly Peter must have felt that day when the Apostle Paul chastised him publicly. Just ripped his heart out, I'm sure. He had to really rethink again everything that he's doing in his ministry. And should I be in the ministry? And you can imagine what Peter must go through. But he didn't quit. He didn't give up. And he learned to let those hurts in his life increase his ministry, increase his effectiveness. Failure forces you to make a decision, doesn't it? And failure, you either get closer to God or you run away from God, but it forces a decision. It forces you to find strength that you don't have, to find help that you would never go to in any other way or reason. God seems to allow the failures so that he can shatter our false dreams and false thinking and then fill us with himself. Lesson number five, five, number five takeaway. Then we have to work within God's timeline. And I don't know how that timeline is for everybody is different. For me, it was like 10 years of restoration. It was a long time. But I can look back and say, God was working through all of that. Moses was 40 years old when he killed an Egyptian in Egypt and runs away to hide in the desert. For how long? Remember? 40 more years. When God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, he was 80 years old. Keep playing. He's 120 at the end of the Exodus. What did Moses have to work through for those 40 years? What kind of guilt or shame from that manslaughter murder thing that he did? How confused was he? What did he have to learn that took 40 years until the time was right? David is anointed to king by Samuel. That's pretty exciting. Samuel says, God has told me to anoint you as king. And then he has to wait years, and Saul the king is trying to kill him over and over and over again. Saul's trying to kill him, and he thinks, I'm anointed. Why is this happening to me? Then he actually becomes king. Paul is commissioned by Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he's sent home to Tarsus to live with his parents for 11 years before he's called to his first ministry. I don't know if he lived with his parents or not. But that's where he's from, and his parents were probably there. He went home for 11 years. As I work on this message about Peter, one thing really stood out to me. Even though Peter has a long list of failures, he just never mentions them in his letters. And Paul never brings them up again. Paul never, never talks about it, ever. There is something about dealing with them God's way that says, done, done. And of course, we're haunted by the memories. 
and the what ifs. And we need to get to the place where we could be like Peter and Paul and say, done. What we do see in the Bible is how failure and pain and betrayal and loss and physical limitations and financial ruin and rejection are all a part of everyone's life. Everyone. And the genius of the gospel, the amazing thing about the good news is how not me and not you, but how God is the one who steps in and makes something good out of the mess. Until I just finally said, I'm done. I can't do this. I can't. I've tried everything. My strength is gone. Now God steps in. Peter didn't make something good out of the mess he was in. God did. Listen. If I could put the whole sermon into a nutshell, just one little thing, a capsule, and just hand it to you, it's this. God puts the solution inside of the problem. While we always want to find the solution outside of the problem. Whatever our problem is. We think it's better over there. The grass is greener over there. The solution might be out there. God puts the solution inside of the problem. We want to avoid the problem and escape all the mess and the hurt. And God wants us to go through it all because in the midst of it, that's where our character is built. And God's so much more interested in our character than our comfort. And everybody in this room, because I know you're all humans, at some point, need forgiveness for something. And probably, we all carry some secret thing that we've do or done that we just wouldn't want anybody to ever find out about it. Maybe when we're a teenager, maybe it still haunts you. We all have something from which we need to be restored. And when we turn again, God isn't going to waste that hurt. He's going to use it. Who are the most effective people to minister to divorced people? Divorced people. Who's going to be the most effective people to minister to alcoholics? A recovering alcoholic. Same with drug addiction. Same with somebody who battles anger. Same with somebody who battles depression. The ones who have the hurt or healed are going to be the ones who can return and help others in their situation. I want to close and I want to share a prayer with you this morning. It's a prayer that I think we can all use. And as we come to the communion table uh, this morning, I want to share it with you. It's found in Psalm 19 from the God's Word translation. Who can notice every mistake? It means who knows in your own heart all the things that are wrong with your life? I don't. My stuff. I don't think anybody knows. And that's what the psalmist says. Who can notice every mistake? Who's aware of it? So he says, then forgive my hidden faults. Keep me from sinning. Don't let anyone, and I would add anything, gain control over me. Don't let me be mastered by any of this stuff. Then I will be blameless. And I will be free from any great offense. That's the goal. And then he closes the psalm with the part that we almost always quote, but we don't quote the part before it. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock, my defender. But he starts with, I don't know all my hidden faults and failures. So God, forgive me of my hidden faults. Keep me from sinning. Don't let anything or anyone gain control over me. Then I'll, then I'll be a blameless. And then I'll be free from any great offense. We should leave that on the screen. So in our time of meditation and communion, while the piano plays, you can just think about that and just 
Make it your prayer. Decide how you want to come to the Lord this morning. And then when you take the bread and the cup, realize you're part of something really special, the body of Christ, the church, the living body of Christ. And when you take the cup and you just have that little bit of juice, the Christ is sharing his blood, his life with you. He's forgiving you of your sins. It flows through you and cleanses you of all unrighteousness if you confess. So come to the table and meet Jesus Christ. He's the host. He's inviting you. And he's inviting you to share because he's not going to throw you away or cast you aside. He wants you to be involved in what he's doing in your life and the lives of other people. And he doesn't want to waste your hurt. He wants to heal it. Let's pray. Father, may we come to this table to find that refreshment, that healing, that restoration, that forgiveness that we need, each one of us together, in Jesus' name. Would you repeat with me our affirmation of faith? I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my personal Lord and Savior. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you today as, as sinners, and we know that without the sacrifice of your Son, our future would be hopeless. And we just thank you for that, and I just pray that we can spread that message to others, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. When Jesus was with his disciples, he took the bread and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and said, This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. <laughs> 